like, was there a time when you felt like that? Like when you show up to a show and you're like, oh, everybody is, is new here. And like, uh, the first one I went to was 1986. Shit. And <laughs> the, uh, the undergrounds were dead. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not to us who know, who are in the know. We weren't part of the fold at that time. There were three tables. Uh, one was Don Donahue with Dory, Kate, Kate Crabb and Bob Crabb and Ron Turner. And that, that was our little refuge in, in the old convention center, which was on 2nd and B Street in San Diego. Yeah. And it was nothing but superheroes. Oh, yeah. and, and people looked at us like, oh, they're the underground people. Oh, how quaint, you know, the old hippies and everything. Mm -hmm. But then what it turned out to be was how we all found each other. So the second year I went, that's when I met Dory and Christine Critter and Leslie Sternberg and uh, George and George always had this little boy with him called Leonardo. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in those days, you could run into Lux Interior and Poison Ivy looking through comics or Mojo Nixon, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. T. Mm -hmm. So in that, in those early years, there were a lot more freaky people. There were a lot of cross dressers and drag queens because of the masquerade thing on Friday night. Yeah. And so it was, it was weirder and a lot more fun. And then everything, let's see, I think in 94, 95, 96, 97, we formed a little collective called the Sin Alley Group. And that was J.R. Williams, Dennis Ward, Wayne Honeth, myself, and Roy Tompkins. Oh, and we had a booth for four years. And in that four years, you could just see everything just changing. Uh, uh, but uh, now the underground people had two aisles. So there was Drown and Quarterly and Fan Graphics and Last Gasp and uh, Dan Nagel. And, and uh, it was good for the underground. So we, we kind of just carved, our, carved a niche out. And I always felt like we did finally, you know, m make our mark. And Jackie Estrada will also tell you oh, yeah. that they were always supportive of underground comics. So it just seemed like a bunch of freaks all thrown together and, and we all found each other. So it was kind of great. And, um, and then, yeah, there was a period where I wasn't doing co comics about, uh, oh, I don't know, 2001, um, I just did too much. I edited the comics journal and then I tried doing a porno comic and that didn't go anywhere. And then I tried doing the Nickelodeon deal and that didn't go anywhere. And then I tried doing the Fleener comics with Macarena and that was, that went over like a lead balloon. And mm -hmm. I just went, I always go back to music. So I went, found refuge and I, did I, you know we formed a rock band and just played uh, a lot for like five years and made cds and you know yeah. we're all in our late 40s but i figured it was the last chance saloon <laughs> what's well, no so you had, a, you had a comic with bongo or was it zongo or something like that what was the mac reaming wasn't well, there the a simpsons, yeah the simpsons was bongo but then they created zongo okay and so my friend millie Smythe that does the merchandising for matt said he wants to start an underground line of comics and he wants to use Gary Panner, and he wants to use you, but it has to be all ages. Oh. And I'm like, uh, okay, I th think I can do that. Problem happened, though. The problem was Gary's work isn't mainstream, and mm -hmm. so he titled it Jimbo, and a lot of the retailers thought it was the character from the show, the TV show, The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. So when they got the comic, it's like, what's this? My kid can draw better than this. So when Fleener came around, it's just not more of that crap. So my advance orders were dre so dreadful. By issue three, I said, I just pulled the plug. I didn't want to waste Matt's money and his time, and I didn't want to waste my time. Well, were you getting a page rate when you worked for Zongo? Uh, it was an advance against royalties of about 1500 okay. bucks. Yeah, and you were doing like the, cuba the cubism style? No, not really. The first one, uh, well, a little bit in the first one. The first one was a wordless story of a bunch of little tiki guys that lived on a tiki island called the Cucamongas. Oh, cool. And so it was absolutely wordless. Uh, the, the center uh, center pages were a game that you could play. I, I put a little game in there where you could win, you know, fortune, romance, death. <laughs> and it was like a, a maze. And I really had fun doing it. Um, but then I issued number three, I thought I was being terribly original, 
And then I picked up a copy of Bone, and I pretty much every all the ideas that I'd done in there, Jeff had already done them, and I was just like, uh. uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think you thought of a really good idea, it's like my bee book. I, I, yeah. I knew that somewhere out there, somebody had done a bee book, and sure enough, the uh, Clan Apis by Jay Hosler. He's drawing in a more realistic, very realistic style. You can okay. see this. And it's really good. You learn a lot about bees. But, like, like you know, thoughts have wings. So there really isn't anything terribly, horribly original. So, but anyway, like I said, I picked up Bone and I read it. And I go, oh, my God, everybody's, everyone's going to think I ripped off Bone because the little character meets a pretty girl in the forest and saves mm -hmm. her. And that's kind of like what I had done in issue three. Right. Have you ever had somebody telling you a story and you're just you're just editing it for them in your head? You're just like, <laughs> you don't need to include any of that information. Just like, <laughs> just like, or you anticipate what they're going to say and you finish the sentence for them. I do that. I have the terrible habit I have. Yeah. You try and figure out like, what, what the ending is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, it's you true. What I really want to talk about, and I think with our, our, you know, people who are watching this would find it interesting is how we met through real good stuff. That's right. Because I think right. it's really, well, this excuse Aaron Lang did this side mm -hmm. and then I did the back side. I did and, the other issue too. Uh, number one. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I did both of like the comeback issues. I was part of a, so I went to, to Seattle in, in 2012 to promote the hypo for Fantagraphics. And mm -hmm. I met all those other guys that were there, like Tom Van Dusen and, and uh, Mark Palm and stuff. And we were talking and, I, and we were just like talking about like our love of like uh, 80s and 90s comics. Like that we're like in Seattle, we're talking about like fanographics, you know, that whole era. And we were talking about real stuff. And we're like, whatever, what the fuck ever happened to Dennis Eichhorn? Like, oh, I love those comics so much. And I think it was Tom was like, oh, I met him. I met him or something. And. And I was like, well, you should reach out to him because, like, I would love to do a story. You know, I would totally draw anything that he has. And and somebody was like, he has other stories, you know, he has stuff. And all of us were just like, well, fucking hey, let's like get together and like get some stories out of him. We'll put together some stuff. So that I was a part of that like initial idea and that project. So um, so yeah. So when I went back home to Denver, uh, uh, Tom Van Dusen started like uh, putting this thing together, and I, I was just in on it. And uh, I did the last two issues. I did two stories for him. I, I love that guy. I really am like a big fan of his. And there was a collection that was like a mass market, like a real stuff collection that came out. Yeah. Um, yeah, the blue cover, you know. It's yes. Like, I got a copy of that at a, like a Borders Books um, in like the early 2000s. And I, that was like some of the first alternative comics I ever got was that collection. Really? Yeah. And I thought it was so much better than I hate. I'm sorry to say this, but. I thought it was so much better than American Splendor because he just had this exciting, crazy fucking life and all these stories. You're like, there's no way. Really? Like, these are all true? Oh, my God. And the, and the cartoonists he was using were more exciting because, you know, well, I guess I have a, a certain amount of love for, like, Gary Dumb. Like, I like Gary Dumb. Um, I, you know, I like a lot of the Harvey's artists. But, but Denny was using, like, Pete Bag and you and... and uh, Carol, uh, I can't pronounce her name. Masoyevich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love her work. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really exciting. So that was huge for me to get to work with him on that, that project. And he was sending me little uh, postcards with like really encouraging words and just like, here's yeah. a check for $20. It was like whatever you can look at for. <laughs> You're lucky you got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was like totally not about the money. It was just like my love for that. Um, that era for that guy and for the work that he did, you know? So I was sad he passed away like right after that, you know, but at least we got to do that. That was a shocker because he was a football player in pretty good shape. He didn't, I don't think he smoked cigarettes and didn't drink to excess or anything. And, and it was just, no, I, he was one of my favorite people too. Um, I, I heard about him. I think he sent me a postcard. And then I got a letter from a guy named Robert Newman that I guess he had worked with. And Robert Newman is a big, biggie, biggie in the illustration world. Mm. And in fact, Robert kind of took a shine to me and held my hand and started getting me illustration jobs and telling me how to do the polite follow-up call and the, you know, the letter and how to charge them. And I, my first job was with the Entertainment Weekly because of this guy, Robert Newman. Wow. And then that's how, kinda, how I met Denny Eichhorn and, 
Robert just was like, he was like this angel that came out of the blue. And next thing you know, I'm getting all this illustration work, which is something I always like to do. And I love illustration work because you just don't think too much about it. You get the story, you have to send them a sketch. It's all boom, 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 boom. And um, I, I, I did well with that pressure. Yeah, but I don't do well when somebody wants to do a comic story on demand. I can't do it. I, it oh, has to really? be something that, that that ferments in my brain for a couple of years. But back to real stuff. Yeah, what was so funny was the story. Okay, I based the cover on the story of him. I think it was either for the welfare department or unemployment, and he goes to check on one of the people that's getting money, and he runs into this freak, and the guy's making peyote tea. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> total, total, total space cadet and then Denny ends up throwing up at you know the end of the story and I noticed that guys really like to draw guys throwing up you never see women <laughs> throwing up in comics it's always guys the puke the puke gag right mm -hmm. so I said okay I'm gonna do my technicolor yawn literally yeah and I did base this on a guy that Paul worked with this crazy little acid baby that was like in his late 20s but he was just you know like mushrooms and, and all sorts of drugs, but he was a weird cat, man. Yeah. And so I open it up and I get to your story and your guy looked exactly like my guy on the cover. I know, how weird is that? We didn't even know, I, we, didn't, we didn't coordinate that. Yeah, here's one of the pages you can see right up close. Oh yeah, jeez. Well, I'm and then, you sense. know, it's, and then it kind of looks like. Yeah, well, that's amazing, man. <laughs> it was just like, and we didn't even know each other and met each other or anything. It was totally amazing. Yeah. And, you know, that, that stuff doesn't happen very often, but I love it when it does. This is really good. Thank you. I, I, in fact, I just read the whole thing. I'm going to see, I like to read books twice. I, I, I plowed through it and then I'm going to reread it with relish again because huh. I just like the fact that there's a funny sort of almost like a every page has a resolution. And sort of a little gag, but not really. But if you are do what we do, you get it. And, yeah. and I just I was laughing my ass off. I that's uh, a really good book. Thank you. Thanks. How do you uh, pronounce his first okay, how do you pronounce this F A N T E? I pronounce it the pretentious way, which is Fonte. Fonte, all right. Fonte Bukowski. <laughs> Fonte. <laughs> yeah, it's that's like my most Goldberg. My most successful uh, comic is that one. My my my, because it was three books originally. Well, they say that. you know in, in in animation, for example, if you can create a character that you care about, mm -hmm. and even though he's a schlub and kind of a loser and, and, and delusional, you're rooting for the guy. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, and uh, it worked really really. Worked. I like the the Bible uh, <laughs> ribbon. <laughs> that's the joy of working with fanographics isn't it like the the design aspect of it you know that when your book comes back it's going to be beautiful the graphics and fanographics <laughs> have always been really good and you know back in the day when i think they had jim blanchard working in them roberta gregory and pat moriarty and that was before computers oh yeah and they were still doing great stuff but they had to cut color with zip -a -tone and do all these mechanics and everything and just like yow and uh yeah that was another shocker kim thompson um mm -hmm. I, I that was really a uh, very sad day about that well your mom worked for disney didn't she well not for very long she uh was hired in 1941 Oh, wow. And my dad was going off to North Africa to fight in the war, and he met a couple of guys on a train, because uh, people took a lot of trains back then. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, my wife's got to move in with her parents. She's got nothing to do. And they go, what does she do? She's an artist. She just graduated from Woodbury College. Well, tell her to come down to the studio and bring portfolios, because they were hiring a lot of women, because the men were all going to war. Wow. And but she got the job, and a month later, she was promoted uh, to the animation department because she was good at what she did and mostly what she worked on were training films for the for the military and I've got a um, two-page uh, loyalty oath thing that they gave all the employees that work for Disney and if you didn't sign this thing and if you 
talked to people you shouldn't have talked to. It was like 10 years in prison and $10,000 fine, which was, a, yeah, it's an amazing document. And the reason I have this is because while she worked there, she used to take the drawings out of the trash that the animators would just toss away because they would sketch and draw all day long. The ideas out of their head, they just like, you know, maybe, you know, want to draw a little bee and, or, or an insect and they just do the head in one antenna and then toss it. Well, yeah. she would take these things out of the trash and uh, she thought they were cute. And so um, she's got, I have about 120 pages of these cells and, and drawings that um, I, I took from her. I said, uh, she lost them for 25 years in her house. She couldn't find them. And then when she finally found them, I go, give me those. Yeah. They're worth a lot of money. And um, now I think it was starting in like the seventies, they started putting locks on the doors with a little slot. So you had to put the art in there because people were selling it and Disney, you know, Disney's kind of a badass company when it comes to people having fun. It sounds like, in fact, um, a friend of mine's grandfather worked there and retired in 84. And a month later, two guys, Two or three guys from the studios came to his house and took everything. The models he had built, the what? sketches, because it was, well, he did them on the company dime, so Disney owned them. Oh, shit. I didn't know they were that strict. Yeah. Wow. So, so when this woman wrote this book called Ink and Paint about the um, women that worked for Disney, she came to my mom's house and interviewed her, and I brought all the artwork with me, and I was half wondering if she was going to try to take it but she couldn't legally but she my mom has some cells from Pinocchio that are back painted and they're falling apart because they're so old and she was suggesting oh well maybe I could borrow these and take them up and scan them because we have a really good scanner and I'm like going I have a really good scanner you're not going anywhere with those <laughs> uh good for you I don't trust those Disney people uh, uh so anyway um she turned 21 at the studio and away from my father didn't they she got married at 19 and didn't see him for two years wow so he showed up one day with his uniform on in a taxi and uh she introduced him to everybody and then off she went to become wow. a housewife the book came out uh she went to a uh, panel with these other old ladies the oldest woman who worked at the hyperion studios is a woman named ruth who's 107 now yeah. and then the next oldest is my mom who's going to be 99 in january Hmm. So there was a, a thing at the D23 event at Anaheim uh, Convention Center. D20, D, D means Disney 23 is when they started the studio. Mm -hmm. And then we went to a thing at the Goldwyn, the, 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 where they have the Oscars up in Hollywood. They had an evening devoted to this woman, the book, and all these ladies on stage talking about themselves. And after those two things, my mom went, I feel like a fraud. I didn't do anything. I didn't invent anything. I, I mean, I just was there for a year and a half. And it was a sad time for her because she was away from her husband. She's living with her parents. Yeah. And, and uh, the war, she didn't, every day she didn't know she'd get the call that he'd been killed, you know. So mm -hmm. all of us are, you know, we're impressed by this. But to her, it's not a big deal. Isn't that yeah. weird? But she was 95 when the book came out. And I kind of, what happened was, I wanted to prove that this art that I have from hers really came from her. So I called at the studio and I wanted to find out if they had her, her employee card from back in the day. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they did. I talked to the lady in the archives and she said, oh yeah, I can send you a, a copy of this or I, I'll send you a file. And I just go, oh my God, here's the proof. This is great. So just as we were talking, Mindy Johnson, who wrote the book Ink and Paint, walked into the room, overheard the conversation, and went crazy because she'd been trying to find people from back in the 40s that worked there. So I get this call one day. You've got my Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> and I thought, you know, she gave up her art career. She gave up, you know, she wanted to be a fashion designer. Uh, she, she, you know, she, got, she gave a career at Disney to, you know, be married. And I thought, you know, that, how tragic for an artist to never get any acknowledgement for what they did. So I really went out of my way to make sure that she met this woman and she got, you know, her name mentioned in the book. Now, not many times, but she was there. Yeah. You know, God, in the 80s and 90s, it was just like bookstores. They did not want to have anything to do with comics. Yeah. Because 
first of all, the display issues, uh, the, the comics traditionally didn't have a spine like a graphic novel, and there was a huge resistance. And so this is the time to be doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Peter Bagg did a book about Zora Neale Hurston, and my first comic book was about her. And I, I had the same philosophy as you. I wanted to get a little more literary and, and you know, illustrate her, her stories. Wait, was and, that uh, this one right here? Yeah, that one right there. Yeah. <laughs> was it, this is your very first comic? Yeah. Who published this? What was this? What's the story behind this? Well, Ray Zone um, was a guy who, unfortunately, he's passed too. He was into 3D comics. He and and Betty, he did Betty Page this, Betty Page that. He made so much money off poor Betty Page. But he did 3D comics of uh oh Basil Wolverton and a lot of different subjects. And then he decided he wanted to do a, a one-shot comic on really good white paper, really good cover stock. So he did one by Kim Deitch, mm. one by the Piz. See, Kim Deitch's was called There's No Business Like Show Business. Pizzas was American, uh, American something, and then he did Hoodoo, yeah. and I thought Kim thought his was going to be in 3D, and then when it came out in black and white, apparently he wasn't very pleased about that. But uh -huh. it's a, it was a beautiful comic. In fact, I own one of the pages. It's about a little, um, a little elephant in a in a circus that learns how to jump off a, a platform and land a little thing of water. Toby. <laughs> Toby's and even the elephant. Anyway, I've got that page on my kitchen wall. It's beautiful. So Ray did these books, and it was uh, 1988, and uh, it was a good thing he used really quality stuff because that was a long time ago, and those pages are still white. Oh so, yeah, I, absolutely. It, it's it, it it held up. Anyway, Peter Bagg did a book called Fire about Sora Neale Hurston, with the same attitude to try to go outside the comic community do something a little more you know literature based and it's a really good book and he draws it in style but he doesn't go into the buddy bradley mm -hmm. craziness like he often did and it's straight ahead drawing straight ahead storytelling and he really did his homework he did a you know as a i thought i was an expert on zora neale hurston and that was, peter's taken that crown away from me but he deserves it he's very good you should try to read it if you can but yeah, how did you get Hoodoo published when you hadn't had anything published before? Were you in like Twisted Sisters or something before that? No, I, I just became friends with Ray because of the art shows at La Luz de Jesus Gallery up in uh, L.A. That's kind of where the lowbrow art movement was hatched. Yeah. And Ray and I uh, had a lot in common. He played music. I played music. Uh, he uh, he had a group called the Art Boys with Carol A and Robert Williams and, and those guys. And so I already kind of knew Carol a little bit. And it was just L.A. people kind of meeting each other and go to enough art gallery openings and you see the same people. You start talking about stuff. And I like Ray because he wasn't a hipster. Hmm. He's just this normal looking guy. And uh, he liked the first. Uh, self-published book I collaborated with some friends with was called Demo and we uh, my friend worked in a print shop so uh, you know somebody works in a print shop you're going to be making comics at night when no one's there yeah so that's what happened and he was impressed by the art I did and and reached out to me and then he was doing uh, a series of books called Illustories so I did one for him. It was only an eight pager, but I did it about a, a voodoo guy with a voodoo doll and the thing, you know, explodes. I, I, forget, I don't even remember. So we kind of met through the mail and through comics. And then he goes, well, why don't you do a whole book about Zora Neale Hurston? Because you're into this witchy voodoo stuff. And the reason I was, because blues. I, I love blues and I love jazz. And so all those things like the black cat bone and the mojo hand or things yeah. that I never knew what they were, but I knew it was something, you know, kind of spooky. And then when I started reading her, it was like, wow, this is right up my alley. I mean, because it, it also like religion. I don't believe in any of that voodoo crap of stuff, but I think the power of the mind, if you want to keep somebody away and you do <clears throat> these rituals and you just sort of put out this mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. that is something that I think is, has potential and is valid. So yeah. anyway, he said, I said, well, can we do Zora Neale Hurston stories? There's this little thing called copyright law. And he goes, oh, no, it's public domain. <laughs> and it was, it, no, it was at that time. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Um, even though Zora Neale's family never supported her, they thought she was a kook. Um, she died alone, penniless. She did have a brother named John Hurston. And I do believe after 30 years, well, sometime in the 90s, he uh, renewed the copyright thing. So um, they, the family has control of her stuff now. And his, his daughter, I forget her name, but she is just like those Twitter people. She doesn't want to have anybody doing anything about Zora unless you're black. She's kind okay. of borderline uh, black Muslim. Okay. Um, so they become um, immersed in that unfortunate um, mindset because I would really love to do another Zora Neale Hurston thing where I illustrate her stories because the, those folk tales are like great. See, this is what's interesting, Mary, is that you were like in that era when it was like this gradient from underground into alternative comics. Oh, know? yeah. So like, could you actually, was that like a visible transition that was happening or is it just like you guys just rebranded underground comics? Well, the thing you've got to go were mini comics. Okay. Because people could all of a sudden, the copy machines were, were really good. You could get really good paper. You could get even like, you know, 90 pound stock if you wanted to do the cover, you know, real, you know, you, you know, good paper. And so the mini comics thing was uh, thanks to uh, magazines like Fact Sheet 5 and Maximum Rock and Roll and Flipside, where they would review not only recordings, but books and mini comics. Yeah. And then people like Pete Bag would review them in the inside of Weirdo. Mm -hmm. And so you would write somebody and send them a mini comic and throw a couple of quarters in there. And then they'd write you back and, and send you a couple of quarters. And thousands of people were doing this. So I think that's what really uh, opened up the alternative market because nobody wanted to do superheroes for two reasons. Those guys that did superheroes, they had a style and they were good. Mm. But there was a glut of them. Yeah. So the slots are already filled. There are already great people doing superhero stuff. You know, did the world need another half-baked, you know, Kirby? You know, no. So that's why people started doing their own, you know, kind of almost combining the art world with um, the fine art world with comics. And so many comics, you were your own self-publisher. You could print whatever you wanted. You could do it at any size you wanted. And um, I always tell people when you go to the comic convention and you want to show off your portfolio, please don't take a portfolio with all these sheets of paper and everything. Make a mini comic. Yeah. The guy can put it in his briefcase and take it home and read it later. If mm -hmm. you had them at like a bunch of Xeroxes, they're going to go right to the trash. Yeah. So yeah. I think but you weren't calling the... yourself an underground cartoonist, were you? Oh, yes. Really? Wow. Yeah. I've always called my, I've always wanted to be an underground cartoonist, and that's what I called myself. I, I think it's a, I just love the word underground. <laughs> I think it's really cool. In fact, that's what this book is about that I'm working on now. It's about me being in college, wanting to do comics, bringing Zap Comics to school, having the teachers call it porno, and there, there was no comic studies. There was, there was the, you know, illustration department was about as close as you got to people that really knew how to draw. Hmm. Everything was abstract expressionism. Yeah, we're talking the 70s. Yeah. So uh, I dropped out. I just walked out of class one day and said, screw this. I'm getting a job. You know, I, I, it's time to grow up and I want to be a musician. So I threw away all my art supplies and told everybody I wasn't an artist anymore. Wow. And I just started playing music. And then after about five years, my muse came back. And, and when I decided I wanted to do art again, I said, okay, this time I'm doing comics. Come hell or high water, I'm doing comics. No more gallery shows, no more, you know, arts and crafts. And so... Um, and that was in the 80s? Well, that was 1884 because a good friend of mine named Don Waller, who was a writer, told me that Matt Groening had written an article in the LA Weekly about the new underground comics. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not dead, folks. And um, I sent away for the issue and... Uh, the first paragraph was, were you the kid in school that drew the whole time the teacher was talking? And then when she looked your way, you'd crumple up the paper and shove it to the back of your desk. And I go, God, that's me. And so he listed a uh, weirdo, Robert Crumb's address, Bra, Dennis Warden's slur, and a, a gang zine called Teen Angel. So I wrote all four of them. And that's what got me going. Um, will you tell me about uh, what happened with Slutburger? 
Well, okay. Did the first two issues for a ripoff press, and then I would go to the comic conventions, and at the ripoff booth, they had the just sleaziest comics, like the Magic Nymphy, and um, like this little sex fairy or something, and everything was just sort of. So, yeah, I like sex comics, and you know I have no problem with nudity or Playboy or Hustler or anything. I worked for Hustler, mm -hmm. but they were just sort of trashy comics, and I was felt I was a little cut above that. And so when Chris Oliveris asked me if, if I wanted to switch publishers, I had to be real honest with with uh, Fred Todd and said, "Well, I think what you're publishing is trash, wow. and I don't want to be associated with it." Oh, there was this one comic called strips and it was about this woman that had these big huge boobs bigger than luba's boobs hmm. and it was just about this you know how she lived with the roommates and it was just you know, all these just vanilla pedestrian sex scenes and i'm like i don't want to be like arrows comics was kind of like that too you know hmm. it was the pink in the wood right yeah anyway so i decided to do the next slut burger for uh drawing quarterly the problem was I was working really slow back then, and there's no way I could put out four comics in a year. Mm -hmm. And mailing the artwork, you had to mail the artwork, <laughs> you know, 32 yeah. pages up to Canada. Yeah. And you couldn't put a value on it because he'd get custom uh, a fee, he'd be charged a fee. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to put a gift or a document, and if you lie, and you, you, you can get in trouble, with it. they'll confiscate the artwork. It was a pain in the neck. Mm -hmm. And then about issue four, I said I did five of them. The fourth issue, uh, my husband got laid off from work at Teledyne Ryan. He's an engineer. They laid off 200 people one day. And he was one of them. And we still had a mortgage and bills. And that's when I was starting to get illustration work, like a lot of it. Yeah. So I get a call from Chris. When's the next comic coming out? I go, well, Chris, I'm making fifteen hundred dollars to do, you know, a double page thing at Hustler, and that's why my advance against royalties are only twelve hundred. I have to do this. I can't be doing Slut Burger. What? And so after that, you just went over to Kim Thompson and said, "Will you?" Oh, you know, can, no, it, no. It, after Slut Burger, that's when Matt Green asked me if I wanted oh. to do a, a an all ages comic. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, I want to do that. So I told Kim I'm stopping Slut Burger. And then in 94, Fanographics did Life of the Party, which was basically the best stuff in Slut Burger. Yeah. So then after the Fleener thing uh, uh, went down in flames, that's when I decided to do a comic for Arrow's comic. I go, all right, do it as a porno now. Let's see. I'm going to set the world <laughs> on fire with my porno. And that didn't do very well either because I had actually had a story in there. I had yeah. humor. I tried to do a sex scene on every page, <laughs> but I realized something to a lot of people, sex is really serious. It's nothing you joke about. Hmm. And as my friend Eric Gilbert from Last Gasp said, he goes, you did not have enough pink and enough wood in there for the punters. Oh, and God. I said, well, yeah, I guess you're right. But, you know, I mean, I thought it was better than Wendy Whitebread, but <laughs> it, it didn't do that well. There's a Bobby London. Do you know this one? Oh no! This is well, great. By is it something that we're gonna, you want to read? Yeah, it's got uh, Sherry Flanagan in it too. The Trotsky strips are in there, and uh, yeah, like, and she's amazing. Yeah, and I wish they'd collect her books. I guess Gary's been trying for twenty-five years oh, to get a collect. No, there's a new, there's a book coming out, um, like in a few Ooh. months, from uh, New York Review of Books is putting out a collection of them of Trots and Bonnie. Yay! Yeah, so you're self-taught as well, right? I mean, you just kind of figure oh, yes. it out as you go along. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, my, my major in college was printmaking. And of course, I took all the classes like life drawing and all that stuff. But the comic stuff was, uh, I had to learn as I went along. In, in fact, I was so conscious of the influence. Like, here in Southern California, the, the influence of Rick Griffin and Crumb was just everywhere. He, oh, he, really? It was just in our, you know, our brains, and, and, and everybody drew Murph the Surf, and everybody drew Mr. Natural. So when I started doing comics, I started drawing with a Sharpie pen. I mean, I wanted something that was so crude that it had nothing to do with the fine line and the cross hatching. And 
I, I tried to, you know, get away from that as much as I could, but I was first drawing on typewriter paper and then Bob mm -hmm. Armstrong, you had the Mickey Rat told me about Bristol board. Yeah, same. I heard yeah. about brushes and then Charles Schultz, Charles Burns showed me how to do the feathering and I was Ooh. on some wow. trip up in Winnipeg. And so it's, I, yeah, you have to pick it up as you go along. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I, can't, I hate, I could never take a class again for anything. I hate classrooms. I yeah. can't even imagine people taking class. I mean, I've spoken at my friend's class comics is literature and that's where people are reading them but not drawing them. But mm -hmm. for their final, they have to draw a comic. Oh, okay. I, I couldn't I, I couldn't stand being a teacher. I can't <laughs> think of anything more boring and horrifying. I don't mind speaking in front of classes, but mm -hmm. to actually teach and to and to you know I, I don't I, I I don't think I have it into me to criticize somebody who would be really bad and, and tried really hard, but they just couldn't do it. And don't get me wrong, I, I like bad art. I like that's why I like weirdo. I, I like yeah. you know really like you know Gary Panner and that kind of thing but to, to I would be so afraid of hurting somebody because I was hurt so bad by my teachers maybe that's it I uh, in fact this one guy and he'll he will remain nameless is a famous tattoo artist and I worked for international tattoo art and he was going to interview me and he wanted to know how I did my style and how I picked my colors and I, I told him everything and he just ripped me off completely. Oh, everything. But that's the thing. It forces you to evolve. Mm. It forces you to do something where it's like, well, try drawing this motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I mailed him a copy of Billy the Bee and I said, go ahead, just try it. Um, yeah, during Comic Con, um, four years ago, Fox Station had banners of The Simpsons done in my style oh my god so obvious that i called up my attorney well the attorney that represented me for the nickelodeon deal and she works for matt graney her name is susan grode mm -hmm. and i said what the hell is this i know there's no copyright on concept but this is not right yeah so i guess uh i got bill morrison from bongo who wrote me and said no it wasn't us it wasn't us it was somebody at fox and then susan sent them a letter and um you know that was that you know what am i going to do i'm I'm not going to fight hollywood i don't have the yeah. money to do that and yeah. once again there's, there's no copyright on you know if somebody copied this line for line i'd have something to work with but if they do the style yeah you can't really so I, so uh, there's a magazine here called Incinitas magazine and they did an article about me six months ago and sure enough the publisher editor guy uh, who's very famous his name is chris cote he does a lot of cote he does a lot of surf and skate stuff he goes oh here's a painting that i just bought from this guy that i know and it looked exactly like oh. and my husband my husband was livid and i go nah, yeah. yeah you gotta let it go right yeah well i i painted the wall of 7-eleven here in instantitis with a, a oh. using this technique with a musician a guy playing a bass Oh, cool. So a lot of people are seeing this and, and they go, wow, that looks cool. I think I'll try it. So yeah. you can't really get too upset about that stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. When I start doing feathering, everybody goes, you're copying Charles Burns. <laughs> okay. Well, no, more like Albert Durer, the woodcut guy, and Lynn yeah. Ward, the guy who did woodcuts. Uh, you don't know your art history very well, but yeah, when I went to Angoulême, a lot of the French guys go, oh, Charles Burns, he lead his style. Yeah. Like he invented it. What? So when I saw you at San Diego in um, 2017, I guess it was. You were working on a book that you said was like a Me Too book. Yeah. Is that what you're still working on? No, uh, that was a story for uh, Drawing Power. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for some reason in my head, I thought that was like your next book was going to be like a Me Too story or something like that. No, that was that. That, that was the story I was working on. And that was Abrams. They they published that too. Cool. And that's a that just is nominated for an Eisner Award, I think, this year, right? Oh, I knew it would be as soon as I, I, I without even looking at the book, the, just the amount of people. I think it's sixty women in there, and yeah. Diane uh, has, you know, she she knows how to edit, and um, she first asked me to do it while I was at the tail end of Billy the Bee, and I turned her down because uh, I was busy and I didn't really have a story at that point, mm -hmm. but then at 
within a couple of months, something happened where I told this friend of mine about something that happened to me and he just blew me off and made fun of me. Oh. And I go, now I have a story. Wow. <laughs> now I have a story. Because that's what happens. If something happens to you, people will say, were you drinking? Mm. What were you wearing? Uh -huh. Why were you out alone at night? Mm -hmm. And that's what the Me Too things about. You're, the victim becomes the uh, bad girl. Yeah. So I finished Billy on May 10th of 2018. And then on May 11th, I started working on the Me Too story. And it was five pages, and it was awful to draw. I hated every second. It was depressing. Mm. It was dredging up all these memories of what had happened to me. And I was just, it was, it was just, it was awful. It was just, but, but by tearing open my chest, holding out my bleeding, beating heart, it got me prepared for the book I'm working on now, where I'm going to talk about all the stuff I did when I was, playing at the gay bars and all the drugs I took and all the sex I had and everything. I'm not afraid anymore. So it served a purpose. You know, it, it served the purpose of um, getting you comfortable with this new venue, like a new way of doing comics because the book you're working on now, right? Like you were saying, it, it's, it comes from uh, like a realization that you could do comics like that. Like you're more autobiographical and um, about uncomfortable things from your life or something or. I mean, is that what you're working on now? Well, yeah. Well, I covered a little bit of this time in my life in Life of the Party with, with the crazy ex-boyfriend and won't go away and the playing in the bars and all that. But I didn't tell the truth 100%. And so to, because the story is a, you know, it's a, a full circle story kind of coming of age. But I basically am writing about how for four years I went insane. And I became a trisexual. I tried anything once. A trisexual. And, well, that's a line from, uh, what's his name? The singer from the New York Dolls. Um, he says that. Uh, what's his name? No, I, I his don't. Name? Uh, well, you know, the, the little Mick Jagger guy. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to, uh, I want to tell the truth, even though it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, I like to joke around now, the whole world to know what a slut I was. In the first chapter, I had three sex scenes alone. So. <laughs> okay. This is definitely going to be adults only, underground, because um, I did take a lot of heat for Billy the Bee. They go, why aren't you doing autobiographical stuff? So I wanted to make a trilogy and do a book about the snake and a book about the coyote. But at Comic-Con, Gary Gross said, would you please do an autobiographical book? Because nobody's doing anything right now. It's very interesting. And I go, I agree with that. <laughs> wow. So when you read mine, I'm... Um, I don't know, I'm just a freak magnet. I've always met, you know, weird and freaky people and I've somehow, you know, managed to escape from these things unscathed, fairly un unscathed. But yeah, you 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 if you're gonna do, you know, autobiographical stuff, you should tell the truth. Yeah. And and um, you know, certainly not a book I'm gonna show my mother. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not gonna show my mother. Was doing the drying power story good for my rage? Yes. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, also, something I'd never told my husband about, and that's why the last panel, I just go, "I know what you're all thinking. What did my husband think? What did he say?" And my husband said, "Well, you know, he's still a rocker." He goes, "Man, that's one fucked up motherfucker." <laughs> and I mean, I mean, that's like Hitler. He's a madman. There's a, there's a point where you you just have to say what a person is they're just they're crazy or something mm -hmm. but i uh i i wish i'd had one more page because this guy that dosed me and raped me um when i moved down here to encinitas he started calling me up out of the blue and stalking me again and saying you know things like remember when i raped you and, oh my god you know, are you afraid of me and i so finally i said you know if you keep this up i'm going to call child protective services you've got a son and I know how to have him taken away from you. Yeah. So, and that ended that. But wow. no, I'd be going up oh, art shows up in LA. And he'd be at the art opening at the show. And I, I, I just thought I'd take the high road and pretend like it never happened. And I didn't realize all this time I was just, I wanted to kill the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Physically put my hands around his neck and kill him. You know, so, um, and well, the reason the story's so fucked up is we already had a relationship anyway. We've already been doing the wild thing. 
Mm -hmm. but he had this fantasy and he liked to give girls drugs and do what he, you know, after they're passed out, have his way with them like Bill Cosby. So that's a weird thing. Yeah, that is a weird thing. And so it's a weird thing to write about. And I wasn't ashamed of the sex. I was ashamed of the fact that I was taken advantage of and I was so gullible. Yeah. But I, I consider myself a pretty intuitive, pretty street smart kind of gal. Mm -hmm. And I got taken. I got, I got worked. And that was really what made me angry. So you're so. drawing that and you're just furious when you're drawing it. And then afterwards, did you, how, how did you feel when it was out and drawn on, on paper and stuff and published? Uh, uh, um, I could have spent a little more time on the art and that's all I worry about. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You get critical, you know, Oh God, look at it. Oh, I didn't give him five fingers. Oh, there's only six or something, or you put an extra <laughs> digit on the hand or I got yeah. the perspective wrong or something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, no, I'm not ashamed of what happened. It's just that, uh, it was, it was, it was uh, not pleasant, like you said, with your book. And, but with this new book I'm doing, though, I'm having more fun because, you know, that was so long ago, and now I'm so much older and wiser. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to see the humor in the situations and, and uh, what happened to me in Drawing Power Story, that's, nothing like that will be in this book. Yeah. It, if anything, it's just, you know, the 70s where anything, you know, you got to think about back then. There was no cell phones. There was no fax machines. There was no internet. I mean, it was a whole pre-AIDS. Yeah. I you know it's hard to explain to people who didn't live then, but it was just, people were wild, man. It just, and you know, and I fit right into this, in this gay, gay bar scene because um, I had a lot of friends, a lot of my male friends came out of the closet. So I had already been going to gay boy bars, but not lesbian bars. So it was a whole whole different thing. But yeah, working for a year and a half every weekend from 9.30 to 1.30 in the morning, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, that would drive, that'll drive anybody crazy. <laughs> it, it, it's a, the musician's lifestyle is really uh, harmful. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to reading that. You're six pages in and it's 200, 200 pages? Well, I got it all, it's all written in, in a little, uh, you know, two little notebooks. So I've got okay. it all, all written down. And what I decided to do this time was pencil the chapter first, then ink it, not do it page by page. Because I, I, I played around with that with Billy the Bee. But, I, but to get the flow of the story, I thought I better just pencil it all out first. So, and it's going to be a lot longer than I anticipated. What I thought was going to be page three is now page 24. Oh, wow. Well, that's great. Yeah. Because the memories are coming back to me, like you know what you know of things that I would forgotten about, um, uh, and and I you know I think when I first started cartooning, I was in so many anthologies where you had to say everything in four or three pages mm -hmm. that that's kind of a hard habit to break. Yeah, you got to give right. things air yeah. now with a book. You know, you give all the space and breathing room and stuff. Yeah, more splash panels and yeah. There was some Kim Thompson told me, he, he you don't have to put six panels on every page. And I go, I know, I know, but I do it anyway. But isn't and that so a joy? I mean, is, is pacing, was that difficult for you to learn, to do like a longer narrative and, and learn how to pace it? No, not really, because uh, I like to tell stories like at parties and stuff. And so I kind of got it down to a fine art where you can kind of reel people in and then you kind of, you know, pop the balloon and they're whoa, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I have, well, since I started cartooning, I have learned how to write. I, I never liked writing. I, I thought it was a horrible subject. I hated it in school. And then I started realizing I had a knack for it. Yeah. And so it kind of came, writing came naturally to me. Uh, what I like to do is when nobody's around <laughs> is read it out loud. Yeah, no, and that, I, I I can get the rhythm of that. It takes you to about page six to start loosening up. It really does, because you've got to be confident, and you've got to be you know, you've got to be uh, brave. Hmm. And if you lose your confidence, you know you then you start procrastinating. I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it also takes until about like if you're doing a graphic novel, it's like by page one hundred, I can actually see what it is I've been doing. Because yeah. most of the time, I'm just, I'm just going forward, and I don't even really know what the fuck this book is or what, 
what the real <laughs> story is. And by the time I get to 100, that's when I can reflect on the first parts of it. And I can see like what's actually valuable to put in there, what I can get rid of, you know, like what things, what themes I should explore further because it's all like intuitive and uh, you kind of put things out on the, on the page that you don't really understand why, but then later on they, they go, Oh, good. Good thing. I put that sandwich there and that, that page back there. Cause now it's useful for this page that I'm on. You know, these, it's very interesting how like the brain works like that when you're writing a story, but it always takes until I'm like midway through before I even know what it is, you know, what the vibe is. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, but that's no, but it's good though, because then when you get to that point, you can tighten it up, you know, you can, and if you need to redraw stuff, you can go back and redraw stuff. Well, well it, it really is more like sculpting than anything else. You know, you get this whole big beefy thing that is your book and then you have to go back and you have to sculpt it. You, you go like, okay, here's what, it, here's what the right. main story is. Let me just try and, chop off this chop off that you know what i mean like it, that's what it feels like to me so yeah i do ceramics i have a wheel in the kiln and it's yeah. that's you're you're right on because that's true you start with a lump of clay mm -hmm. and then you make a form but then you have to trim it and mm -hmm. glaze it and yeah it's a it's a it's very similar to sculpture i would yeah yeah, yeah. well all i know is i've got about five percent okay on my okay let's head. let's end this Thank you so much for talking to me. I appreciated it. No, this is great. I've always wanted to know what you were like. And <laughs> here I am. Now I'm, now I'm even more confused than ever. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs>